which has uh, some problems uh, with regard to real schools. But on the other hand, you know, it has a great uh, uh, more opportunities because you can reach out to students around the globe. So that means you have technically no limitations uh, what a real school has. So um, our subject for today is the history. And it's always good to start with the history because uh, uh, what we have today is the result of a history. And you will not understand what is happening tomorrow if you have no clue where all this comes from. And so, and with the, uh, uh, that's why I have uh, the subtitle for the lecture is stumbling forward into an uncertain future. So that means we know where we are coming from, but at this uh, very uh, crucial moment in history, we have no clue where we are moving forward. So because this are, it's an uncertain future. And as the uh, former president of the United States, Bill Clinton, has uh, uh, defined the process on internet governance during uh, a speech in an ICANN meeting, he said, you know, this process is totally unclear. It's like stumbling. And as long as it goes forward, this is good. So what we are doing is really stumbling forward. Next slide. So uh, in my lectures at the university, I always ask students, you know, do you know the birthday of the internet? And then you get uh, several uh, replies. One says, okay, this is in the end, uh, end of the 80s, early 90s, when Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. As I say, no, 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 this was already in uh, the uh, 1980s when John Postel invented the domain name system. Then others refer to the uh, TCP IP protocol, which was done in the 70s uh, by uh, Bob Kahn and Vin Cerf. And as I say, no, it goes back to 1969 when the first four computers were connected um, uh, to uh, uh, on, a, on a horizontal way and created a new uh, communication system, which was not organized hierarchically, like all communication system we knew in the in, in the past, like broadcasting, telecommunication, all this is organized in, in a hierarchical way. But you know, the innovation came that uh, the new communication system, which was called the ARPANET, uh, was uh, done in a horizontal way. So that means there no center. Uh, it was uh, a network and not a hierarchy. I think this is a very fundamental uh, starting point uh, that you make differentiate between networks and hierarchies. Because the internet is indeed a network, as we call it, a network of networks, because there is no really center and no uh, uh, unique um, uh, um, uh, point of um, where you can attack it. So that's and, and attack is the right word because why the ARPANET was developed in uh, and, and first implemented in 1969. This goes back to the year 1957 when the Soviet Union launched its first Sputnik, and this was became known in the history as the so-called Sputnik shock for the uh, US because the US uh, in all the wars they were fighting over centuries where as a, a country was safe because they had friendly neighbors in the north and the south and they had two oceans on the east and west coast. So that means all the, the fighting uh, uh, which took place was outside of the territory uh, of the United States in Europe, in Asia, uh, or elsewhere. So, but uh, the only real war on American territory was the Civil War, and this was already uh, earlier in the history. So, uh, with the Soviet uh, Sputnik, so the Americans realized they have a window of vulnerability which comes from the outer space. And so they said, okay, we have to do something, how to react to this new challenge. And then by discussing in the 50s and 60s to uh, how to react. So uh, the, um, uh, the idea came up, uh, you know, uh, what would the Russians attack if they attack us via the outer space? And one, one idea was probably they will attack our communication system because if an army is distributed around the globe, then you need very good communication. And so that means the attack of a communication system would disable uh, the functioning of uh, the military. 
And so the idea was developed in the 1960s by the Rent Corporation to develop a decentralized communication system which no center so that means if the was uh, the russians would have attacked the united states they would have needed more rockets than servers in the distributed system so it was a special element of the arms race so why i tell you this story uh, it's partly forgotten uh, but it says it indicates that the start of the internet was uh, it started with a military phase. So this is what I've called here on this slide, the, the, the wave one. So uh, it, it was financed by the Pentagon. So that means the researchers were working with contracts uh, for the Pentagon. So it started as a, a, a military project. So in the 1970s, end of 69, uh, we, entered in a phase which was called detente so that the Americans and the Soviets made some arrangements to get the uh, nuclear arms race under control. Uh, that was called the Strategic Arm Limitation Talks, uh, which started in 1969 in Helsinki. SALT uh, was the acronym for this. And uh, so, but um, the, in so far, you know, the, the, the risk for the Americans to get attacked by the Soviets was reduced but anyhow you know with this new communication networks where so many uh, graduate students were involved so we had a new wave that uh, now the technology was there so that means you could uh, uh, you have demonstrated that you could build a decentralized network where no power is in the center and all the knowledge is on the edges. And in so far, uh, this graduate student said, okay, they did see it like a toy and said, we can play with it. And, and, and so, you know, with this, let's say, in, um, uh, incentive, which came from the military, the academics uh, took over the whole process. And so the internet was developed in the 1970s and 1990s in a very bottom up way by all these uh, uh, youngsters, which uh, were also inspired, uh, let's say, politically or philosophically uh, by this um, uh, hippie uh, uh, time. You know, if you go to San Francisco, we have flowers in your hair. So this was the uh, a, a time where you had a new idea of freedom, of independence, and uh, so you could do anything. So uh, the uh, Vietnam War was over. So and and uh, and, and and this was a, a, a moment for innovation. And this is what really then uh, you know feeded the development of the internet, which became uh, really an, an, an academic um, uh, uh, platform and a, a tool used mainly by academics, which developed step by step all this, what we know. So the, the invention of the TCP IP protocol with Bob Kahn and Wind Surf was certainly, you know, the, uh, you could say the icebreaker or the turning point, because this was clear that you cannot only build, you know, one a horizontal uh, network, you can link the networks together. So it became the network of network. And this is what we call internet today. This was in 1974. And then a lot of people developed all these various elements like the ad or the, the domain name system, Mocha Petris and John Postel did this. And then so the IP addresses were invented. And so we had a, a global network already at the end uh, of the 1980s when Tim Berners-Lee, on top of this, then introduced what we know today as the World Wide Web. So, and the World Wide Web opened the door for a commercial use of the internet. I remember that I was teaching in the early 1990s uh, at the American University in Washington, D.C., at the School of International Services, and my email address was uh, au. EDU, so I had an EDU address, and people with a .com address, these were the bad people. So EDU people were good people, and com, uh, uh, .com was the bad people. And, you know, a lot of this community in the early 90s uh, said, oh, no, if you use it for commercial purposes, this is a misuse of the internet. So this is really just for uh, freedom of expression, freedom of communication, and so, uh, but you know, suddenly with the uh, options the, the World Wide Web offered, so it was uh, absolutely clear that it took only a couple of months or years, so that people 
discovered that this new medium, this new network can be used, you know, for new business or what at this time was called uh, the new economy. And this uh, produced what uh, became known as the so-called dot-com boom that suddenly, you know, you saw this explosion of the people which were connected to the internet, you know, from 10,000 to 100,000 to 1 million to 10 million to 100 million. Today we have, by the way, 4.5 billion people on the internet. So never before in the history of mankind, you had a communication system, which within a quarter of a century, you know, started from zero to 4.5 billion. So, and uh, the uh, uh, opportunity to use a network for commercial um, purposes and to build a whole new economy uh, on top of a network, and this was mainly the World Wide Web and the HTTP protocol, so really opened the door for things which uh, uh, were uh, unbelievable in the early 1990s, and nobody uh, could imagine this. Certainly, you know, this was overheated. Then we saw the blast of the dot-com bubble in uh, the year 2000. So I was teaching at this time in Aarhus University, and when uh, I was discussing the blast of the dot-com bubble, I said, okay, this is only, uh, 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 you know, um, one moment where we saw this um, this blast of the bubble, but ten year in ten years from now, this was 10, 2010, we will be on a higher level. So that means it was clear already when uh, the bubble blasted that uh, uh, there will be a tomorrow. So this is not, uh, 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 let's say, a collapse of the system. This was just, you know, to to bring uh, the development down to earth and to look for a more sustainable development. And this happened uh, after 2000. So when the uh, internet was not only used anymore for uh, commercial use, but you know, for a lot of other things. So that means uh, it became like a mass medium. So a lot of people really uh, started personal websites and uh, used it for culture, for all kinds of um, uh, activities which um, were, um, uh, uh, although, you know, which existed already in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, but had nothing to do with the internet. And so this was discussed in the ALIA and the World Summit on the Information Society because the 193 member states of the United Nations realized that um, this is more, just more than a technology. So this has political implications. And if you go through the documents which were uh, discussed and finally adopted uh, by the World Summit on the Information Society, the Tunis Agenda or the Geneva Action Plan, then you see that uh, already 15 years ago, uh, policymakers realized that the internet will penetrate all areas of life, you know, from education to culture, to media, to the economy, to science, to uh, uh, agriculture. Uh, so there will be no space will be untouched from the internet. So, but the next wave came uh, with the smartphones and the social networks. So when the World Summit took place, Google was in 2003 and 2005, Facebook didn't <laughs> exist. So Google was very small and was the, 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 the everybody's darling. Don't do evil was the slogan of Google. So it was dominated at this time by Yahoo and, and, and uh, uh, um, uh, CompuServe and some others, names which are partly forgotten today. Uh, but you know, the uh, with the, social networks and you know with the invention of the smartphones uh, this has rocked uh, the, uh, the the whole system because now it became clear that everybody and everything can be connected to the internet so nobody could imagine even in the early 90s that you know with a smartphone you you have your your radio you have to tv set you have your photo uh, you have everything in your pocket uh, connected to the internet. So the internet in, became the big enabler for new applications, new services, uh, new networks, 
And in so far, so uh, it was uh, the discussion we had in the 90s, whether we have an economy and a new economy uh, or what uh, Tim, uh, what John uh, Perry Barlow said, you know, uh, we have the, the information society as a new society with a new democracy and a new understanding uh, of uh, mankind. And then we have the old uh, uh, industrial society where uh, the giants of uh, steel and flesh do their things. And so we talked about two different worlds. So I think the smartphone and the social networks made very clear that we have not a new economy and an old economy, we have one economy. And we have not, let's say, a new world and an old world, we have one world. And, uh, but this economy, this uh, economy is a digital economy. And this one world is a cyber world. So where the internet has penetrated all areas of life. So, and this has uh, had another effect. And this is where we are today in the year 2020 and uh, looking forward into the year 2030, where all the conflicts of the world, which were there uh, the whole last century, are now back in the internet. So it's not <laughs> conflicts of the internet. So the conflicts of the world so are now internet, uh, uh, have an internet component. So because all the conflicts between uh, uh, superpowers, between China and the US, uh, you know, the, the arms race, uh, the, the other local wars and all this, what we happened in the last century, they did not disappear. So they had nothing to do with the internet in the um, uh, 19, 70s, 80s, 90s, or even in the year 2000 and 2010. But today, I think uh, we see uh, ahead of us uh, how the whole cyberspace is weaponized. We see the militarization uh, of uh, the um, uh, uh, digitalization. And we see that the internet and all these applications are pulled into geostrategic power games. So uh, you have seen this recently under the Trump administration, when the Trump, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, adopted a number of executive orders to kill uh, Huawei or TikTok or WeChat in the US, and you did see the reaction from China. So that means the big power relationship is now part of the um, internet governance uh, policy. So, and uh, in so far, things have changed in the last 20, 20 years. Next slide. And uh, so uh, that's why, you know, because we are in this uncertain times, uh, a lot of people asking, we will see a new cold cyber war. So we had on the, uh, like in the nuclear age, when there was a risk between Soviet Union and uh, the, the, the United States, that uh, the whole world will be pulled into a nuclear war. You could ask the question now, will there be a cyber war? So, and uh, in, in, indeed, uh, 25 years ago, when Barlow published the uh, Declaration of Cyber Independence, there were a lot of dreams. And uh, this was reflected also in a, a document, which is also nearly forgotten, the Okinawa Charter of the G8, where Russia was a member in the year 2000. And Bill Clinton, this was his last uh, G8 meeting when he participated. And they had a lot of um, visions, you know, how for an, a nice future. So, but at this time, the internet was more or less a technical problem with some political implications. Uh, but the things have changed now. It's now a political problem with the technical component. And this is a fundamental difference. And the second difference is since 2000 is that uh, in the year 2000, the US was the only uh, uh, cyber power in the world. So, but the US isn't anymore the only big band in town. So that means you have other cyber superpowers, mainly China, but uh, you have India, you have this 1.3 billion people, uh, you have uh, the European Union, which uh, starts to uh, dominate the regulation on the internet. The EU wants to be a norm maker, not a norm taker. So this is an, uh, another 
big issue and then you have Russia, you have Brazil. So that means uh, this has also changed uh, the landscape. And indeed, there are some similarities to the Cold War of the 1950s. So that means you have different systems. In the 1950s, it was communism versus capitalism. Today, you have the conflict between democracies and autocracies. So when we had recently the meeting between the foreign ministers of China and and uh, the United States in uh, Alaska. So the um, uh, Chinese Politburo member Wang told uh, uh, State Secretary uh, Blinken that we have two forms of democracy, the United States style democracy and the Chinese, uh, the Chinese style democracies. So these are two different, two different systems. So, and the question is, you know, how the conflict is played out. And then you have controversial strategies. So at, uh, in, in um, the um, 1950s, it was the communist world movement and the United States reacted with the rollback. So uh, what we see today is China has the digital Silk Road and we see on the other hand the so-called color revolutions which want to uh, stop uh, the um, uh, uh, autocratic developments in various parts of the world. So, and what you also have is a uh, mutual mistrust. So in the 1950s, you had real spies. There were Russian spies in the United States and American spies in the Soviet Union. Now you have, it's no need anymore to send spies to different countries. You have now the virtual spies. And just recently with the solar mines attack, you have seen that, um, and the arguments also used by the White House, which argued, you know, as long as it's espionage, then, you know, it's unfortunate, we have to react. But uh, th there is no treaty in international law, which uh, says that uh, espionage is against international law. So that means uh, espionage is more or less uh, recognized as a uh, effect of, of, of uh, uh, real uh, policies. So that means we have a lot of similarities to the Cold War and the internet plays <laughs> a key role in, uh, in, in all this. So, but we have also differences uh, to the Cold War. And uh, in so far, it's uh, also important to realize that uh, there is no iron cordon and Berlin Wall in the world anymore. We have open borders and we see a multicultural uh, uh, a world. So, and we have no economic separation as we had in the uh, in the Cold War with the COCOM regulations. We see economic interdependence. So, at the 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 high level group uh, on digital cooperation, which was established by the um, um, UN Secretary General Guterres two years ago, uh, has called our uh, time the age of cyber interdependence, not independence as Barlow was calling for, he called it interdependence. So that means with all the conflict and ideological conflict, cultural conflict, uh, you know, power conflicts between China and the US, there is an interdependence and a high level of economic interaction. So that means ideas to decouple the economy are very risky because you know this would probably create damage for both sides next slide please so that means uh, how this will be worked out uh, glenn can you go to the next slide thank you so that means we have uh, probably academics always work uh, with scenarios so that means i have here two scenarios the worst case scenario and the best case scenario the worst case scenario is that we move into an area of confrontation. That would mean uh, a militarization of the cyberspace and a digital arms race. We have now this new type of weapons, which are called laws, uh, lesser autonomous weapon systems, you know, drones, killer bees, robots. You know, you can have proxy wars, as you see now, between Israel and Iran, or, you know, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, cyber attacks just below the red line of Article 2.4 of the United Nations Charter. So the United Nations Charter has defined uh, that um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the threat and use of force is against international law and would justify 
uh, the uh, 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 would create, uh, you know, would, would could trigger what we call the right of self-defense. This is in Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. That means if a country is attacked, then it has the right to fire back. And this is Article 51. But you have to make clear uh, that this attack is an attack and according to the definition of the uh, threat and use of force in the United Nations Charter, Article 24. So that means uh, governments now which try to attack the enemy try to be below this uh, and to not allow the enemy to make use of Article 51. So I think this is one of the power games we have now also in cyber wars that, and the solar winds attack is a very good example where we say, okay, if we do not go too far and uh, our attack cannot be interpreted as uh, a violation of Article 2.4 of the United Nations Charter, then uh, so we could avoid the big cyber war. So it, it's a little bit playing in a gray zone uh, where, uh, you know, all these new things, these cyber attacks are not clearly defined in international law. And by the way, there is also no big interest, neither on the Chinese side nor on the American side, to define the red lines. Because if you have a red line, then you could have a cascading effects with dangerous escalations. So that's a risky path, and this is one option in a worst case scenario of growing a confrontation. Uh, in the worst case scenario, uh, would affect also the economy. So that you really decouple the global digital economy. Uh, this would refer to all these um, um, uh, uh, delivery chains. Uh, and so you could build, uh, build digital fortresses where you have no, uh, uh, let's say, uh, trade anymore, you know, with the enemy. Uh, this would backfire also. Both sides uh, would lose. That's why, you know, it's a worst case scenario. This would go uh, along with massive violation of individual human rights, as you see it now already in autocratic uh, countries with censorship and mass surveillance and all this which comes along, you know, with uh, face recognitions, with biometric data and all this. Uh, so that means all the um, rights, human rights, which are laid down in the Human Rights Declaration from 1948, in which are seen as big achievement uh, uh, in, in, in today's world, in the free world at least, so it could be under big pressure and this could go, could affect also uh, freedom uh, of expression and privacy in democratic countries. So if you have to protect you against, uh, let's say, the, the enemy, this would also backfire how you exercise your human rights even in a in a, a democratic society. And this could lead to a political fragmentation and the building of blocks. So as we had in the Cold War with the Warsaw Pact countries and the NATO, uh, the Chinese call now the blocks cliques. So, and uh, on the one hand, we could have a transatlantic partnership based on common values, democracy, freedom, like between the European Union, uh, the United States, and now the so-called Quad countries, which are Australia, India, and, and, and Japan. Uh, it's, a, it's a network of four countries, which was established already 10 years ago and was rediscovered just recently by the Biden administration. But on the other hand, you see the building of what, what I call here the Trans-Asian Partnership. So immediately <coughs> after the Alaska meeting, between China and the US, you had a meeting between the Chinese and the Russian foreign minister, and they agreed to enhance their cooperation on cybersecurity and the digital economy. And um, uh, China has um, agreed on a treaty with Iran, 25 years of cooperation, where uh, China will build the um, 5G network in Iran. And Russia and Iran has uh, signed a cybersecurity bilateral cooperation. Uh, treaty. And so that means uh, you could see um, uh, a, a partnership, probably not an alliance, between China, Russia, Iran, and some other countries. And this would trigger probably 
what we uh, uh, that some countries would say, okay, we what we have no interest to get pulled into a battle between a big superpower. So let's think about non-aligned movement where we do not uh, we do not like the Chinese. Uh, approach, but uh, we are not uh, so close to the American, and uh, it could be lead to uh, what some people have already um, this, uh, labeled the a digital non-aligned movement. We had this non-aligned movement uh, uh, in the 1950s when Warsaw Pact and NATO was established, and the Indian Prime Minister Nehru said, okay, we do not want to become pulled into a nuclear conflict between uh, Russia and uh, the United States. So let's have equidistance to uh, these big powers. And this could be repeated. And then uh, in a worst case scenario, you could have also a standardization war. We have already debates about the new internet protocol, about 6G and all this uh, new development. So uh, next uh, slide, which will be nearly the last slide. So I come to the end uh, and this will be the best case scenario. So that means there is there is hope uh, that we can avoid this uh, confrontation. So uh, one hope comes with the UN roadmap on digital cooperation, that you have now a network, a platform where uh, although you know the enemies are sitting on the negotiation table and uh, with the idea to enhance the uh, the Internet Governance Forum to what is called now the IGF Plus uh, with a multi-stakeholder high-level body, with a parliamentarian track, uh, with the uh, uh, way now to VISIS Plus 20 in the year 2025. So that means the United Nations at this moment could offer a constructive alternative where the conflicts between the superpowers could be negotiated and could be uh, 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 managed in a certain way so that you can avoid these negative conflicts, you know, with a digital trade war or a cyber war with uh, uh, autonomous weapon systems. So uh, that means you could have international arrangements to stabilize cybersecurity. So I could imagine that uh, governments could agree on a moratorium or a prohibition of killer robots. Uh, UN Secretary General Guterres is calling already for uh, many years that this should be prohibited like uh, chemical weapons. So that means uh, there is an option that uh, probably not all the new digital uh, offensive uh, systems, but that you pick out some elements. This would help to create a better climate of confidence building or something like that. So you could also introduce a treaty to, uh, for prohibition of cyber attacks against critical infrastructure. So we see today attacks against hospitals, energy systems, water systems, transport systems. It's the interest of all sides that this should be stopped. And uh, so that means both China and the United States, the European Union and Russia have an interest that uh, uh, no uh, hospitals should not be attacked. So, and we have already some uh, networks now. The open-ended working group in the General Assembly of the United Nations has now a mandate to negotiate about uh, some of these issues until 2025. So, I think that's an important element that you have <coughs> um, a platform where, where governments can negotiate. And uh, you could have also some international arrangements in the digital economy. So the World Trade Organization hopes that they finish uh, a new digital uh, trade treaty until November this year, when there will be the next ministerial conference <coughs> in November, in, now in Geneva, because the original uh, uh, ministerial conference was postponed twice and will now meet probably virtually in Geneva in November. So that means an international treaty which would stabilize the digital economy would be helpful. And this relates also to a big issue for many countries, uh, which is negotiated in the G20 and the OECD. It's about the digital taxation. That means that all the winners of the pandemic, you know, the uh, big transnational corporations, both from China and from the US, you know, pay 
uh, something for the recovery of the world economy. And in so far to have a fair share of the money in the post-pandemic time uh, via uh, international recognized uh, new uh, taxation regime would be helpful and would contribute to um, uh, a higher level of cooperation in a best case scenario. The same is with sustainable development goals and the digital divide. So we have made some progress since the visit since 2005, but we are still far away, you know, to reach, uh, to, to overcome the digital divide. And in so far to have more investment in Africa, in Latin America, in a lot of South Asian countries. Uh, so that means to uh, bridge the digital divide and to uh, help uh, the remaining uh, 2.5 or 3 billion people to get connected uh, would be a big thing if this could be achieved until the year 2030. So there is a need and uh, hopefully also some progress to have uh, international arrangements for artificial intelligence. This is the next big thing. And this could become a battlefield, but this could be also a lead to some arrangements among uh, big powers. There are at the moment negotiations underway in UNESCO. UNESCO is planning to adopt a treaty on the so-called ethics of uh, AI, which would introduce some principles how to use AI. And the plan is to adopt such a legal instrument on the uh, uh, next general conference of UNESCO, which is in November this year. And then you could uh, also find safeguards for the management of critical internet resources and the standards, so that all these technical elements are not pulled into this geopolitical conflicts, but remain neutral outside of this battle between uh, uh, cyber superpowers. And this is what uh, ICANN is trying to do now. Uh, Joran Marby has introduced this term in uh, the technical internet uh, uh, governance, which says, you know, we are, ICANN is not doing internet governance per se which uh, is more related to the use of the internet. So we are providing the resources for the use of the internet. And ICANN has nothing to do with the use, uh, how governments, other stakeholders, private sector, other groups are using the resources. We are just providing the resources and we are neutral. So I think this is also would be, uh, would contribute to uh, a higher level of uh, confidence building in the international scene. So this is the best case scenario. And now the last slide, uh, uh, Glenn, uh, is uh, what is the realistic uh, expectation? So uh, I think going back to Bill Clinton, what we'll see the next five years is a stumbling forward with a mix of confrontation and cooperation. So with all the experience we have from the meanwhile 70, 80 years of internet development, uh, there will be confrontation. You cannot avoid this. So I think we have different value systems and we have aggressive behaviors and autocracy and democracy, um, uh, two systems which uh, it's difficult, you know, to to uh, combine them. So that means there are differences. But the, the, the big challenge is how we can live with these differences and how we can identify uh, fields of cooperation uh, where we can uh, contribute to a certain level of confidence, of mutual trust in the interest of all mankind. So the source of hope is that regardless of all this uh, nuclear arms race we did see in the 50s, 60s, 70s, we had no nuclear war. Uh, and uh, the, the Hiroshima and the Nagasaki uh, uh, drop of the, uh, of, of the bomb in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were the only nuclear bombs. So that means if we can avoid the, a big confrontation and can stumbling forward, so we can achieve a lot. And in so far, the internet has a um, good future, probably not a brilliant future. So, but uh, it's, uh, you have to fight for this every day and it needs the engagement of all stakeholders. So at the moment, it seems that governments are take over, but uh, the reality also tells us that 90% of all the applications and the infrastructure is owned by the private sector or by non-state actors. And so the 
a uh, big challenge also for the next 10 years will be how governments realize that they need the enhanced cooperation with non-state actors from the uh, private, uh, from the industry, from civil society, from the technical community and other organizations. So that means we have um, good, uh, we have a toolbox how to manage the challenges of the next 10 years. We have to make use of it. Thank you and back to Clem. Great, thank you so much, Wolfgang. I, I, I've, I'm turning to the questions. Uh, we have a, a few minutes for, for people to post their questions, but perhaps I could start it off with, uh, we have a new bill called uh, C21, uh, C11, which is a new privacy bill. It's actually getting a lot of heat in terms of regulating content uh, on the internet. Uh, and, and it all ties back to, you know, maybe a potential tax revenue for governments. What's your, what's your opinion on that? Uh, <clears throat> this is really one of the hot potato. I would not say th uh, since a couple of years, this goes back to the invention of the printing press uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, uh, the question of what is good, what is bad content. So, and you will never find an answer, you know. And when Gutenberg invented the printing press, the Catholic Church was very excited and said, this is a great thing, we can distribute the Bible now, uh, you know, and bring it uh, to everybody. But then, you know, people started to write critical pamphlets against the Bible, and then the Catholic Church started to introduce the index of censorship and said, no, 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 no. So uh, the bishop has to decide what is justified or not justified to print. Over centuries, we ended up with the Human Rights Declaration and Article 19, which says there should be uh, the freedom of expression and the freedom to distribute and to receive information. And the convention added, you know, uh, taking into account uh, let's say uh, it can be restricted under certain circumstances. So that means, and the circumstances are very slippery territory. So that means you can restrict global level uh, um, freedom of information uh, if national security is challenged or public order or public health, by the way, uh, and moral. So that means there are some justification, even in the United States with the First Amendment, which uh, uh, forbids Congress to make any law to restrict uh, freedom of speech and freedom of the press. So uh, you have the so-called clear and present danger formula, which goes back to the First World War, and which says Congress under certain circumstances can even introduce some restrictions. So this is very difficult and you will never find, you know, a general regulation uh, for, for, for content. It has to be done case by case, taking into account the context and the concrete circumstances. So certainly, you know, some uh, some content is unacceptable. Child porn is something where uh, I think the world agrees. But then you have a lot of uh, areas where slippery territory and different constituencies have a different idea. What Facebook is doing now with the um, uh, with the uh, 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 with its board, uh, you know, is is an effort. But you know, uh, you need a, a neutral third party. So that means if it's done by a corporation. It's not neutral. In the US, you have the, 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 the constitutional court, you know, which can clear issues. My famous uh, case is always New York Times versus President Nixon when uh, um, Daniel Ellsberg, you know, published the lies over the Vietnam War and the New York Times printed it. So that was a five to four decision of the Supreme Court, but so it was <clears throat> very close. And in so far, you know, regulating content is uh, an extreme complicated thing and there will be no general rule. So it's an ongoing fight and you will discuss this the next 20 years. Privacy is, is a different thing and probably uh, also I think in the old constitutions we have uh, uh, you know, basic rights to protect your home, to protect your communication and, and all this. That means, you know, with the internet you have to uh, face this as a new challenge and uh, this can be undermined. Everybody can come now to your home uh, via a cable or, you know, uh, via your mobile phone. 
And uh, in so far, you know, something has to be done. The European Union has started this, you know, with the GDPR. And now California has said, okay, that's a good example. So you have, it's a controversial issue. You know, I did this discussion in, in, in China. I was part of the European uh, Chinese uh, 1.5 track consultations. And so that means if you try to go deeper with the GDPR in China, then they say, okay, a moment, we have to reserve the right of the Communist Party to go into, under certain circumstances, <laughs> certainly, uh, uh, to um, uh, watch what, what these people are doing. So that means uh, you have to find uh, a solution uh, which it's difficult, you know, on a global level. On the other hand, what I see with the GDPR is that it gets more and more recognition. And uh, we have not yet a project in the United Nations. So the third committee has not yet a draft a global convention on data protection on the table. So it will need more uh, national legislation on this. And if you have enough uh, national experiences probably in five or ten years from now you could find a global arrangement so this will become more urgent you know with all this new biometric uh, uh, data which is collected with via mass surveillance facial recognition and all this so we couldn't add, we could add, end up really in a in a world uh, in an orwell world and nobody wants this so that means you have to find the balance between protecting your rights uh, uh, without violating uh, freedoms. So, and this is a difficult uh, answer. So I have no concrete recommendation for the national legislation in the US. If you have a discussion, this is good. You need the controversies have to come on the table so that you can listen to both sides. And then, you know, uh, 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 stakeholders have to find out what is the right balance and so far the multi-stakeholder model is also very important to find a balanced solution so uh, a, po a polarization will undermine a reasonable uh, answer to this very urgent question great thank you uh, uh um quite a bit of vibrant discussion in the uh, chat uh, i just want to read it out to those who don't see the sh chat uh sean Bitsu has said, with pandemic dollars being rolled out in the near future, I know big pushes are going towards providing broadband in more rural uh, and poor uh, areas uh, and communities. And he's asking if there's any, uh, from your experience, any international programs that are pushing this strategy worldwide? Oh, yes, this is what I mentioned with the uh, sustainable development goals. So that means in the 16 so-called SDGs, you have no special uh, goal for um, uh, digital technology. So, but uh, in the discussion, which is called now the uh, um, uh, Decade of Action, so the United Nations has adopted uh, the 2020s as the Decade of Actions uh, until the year 2030 to implement the um, uh, uh, sustainable development goals Digitalization is a key element. The African Union has just recently adopted a 10-year plan for the digital transformation of Africa. And, you know, with all these new uh, technologies, 5G, 6G, uh, uh, you know, uh, wireless technology, so uh, the push for broadband in these underserved regions so, uh, is uh, now from, from it or has moved from a dream to a reality. So that means uh, a couple of years ago, we didn't have this undersea cable. Uh, now, you know, whole Africa is surrounded by undersea cable. So that means the challenge is now to bring the signal, you know, from the shores uh, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, inner of the country. So uh, I remember a couple of years ago, 15 years ago, we had an ICANN meeting in, in, in Accra, in Ghana. So uh, while we had good uh, internet connection in Accra, then we moved uh, to the inner of the, uh, to, to the big African market in Kum, uh, Kumasi was the name. And uh, it was just three hours out of Accra, mm -hmm. but there was no internet connection at all. So, and uh, in, in so far, I think that the programs which are pushed forward now 
by the United Nations, by the ITU, by the so-called uh, Global Broadband Commission, uh, which is uh, co-sponsored by the ITU and, and UNESCO. So we have a lot of programs. The World Economic Forum is behind this, and we see regional initiatives in the Asian countries. I mentioned the digital transformation plan from the African Union. Uh, so I see a lot of hope, and the, the hope comes uh, also, you know, with the expectation that a new generation, which has now already the mobile phone in the pockets, will discover immediately as quick as people did in the West in the 1990s or 20s that you, you have a toy. If you play with a toy, you can develop a lot of new applications. So that means if you bring next to the infrastructure also education to Africa and to Southeast Asia and to Latin America, and uh, the instruments also, you know, for self-training. And uh, then uh, there is uh, really hope it will take another decade. Uh, but I think in the year 2030, we will have a better situation as we have it today. Um, a lot of really good comments. Uh, I want to pull out uh, something that Elena is talking about. She's saying that uh, Facebook is addressing the issue that they've been criticized as harboring a number of, of um unsavory characters uh, and their advisory board is having content moderation. Chekhov is in Russia is doing contact moderation. Her question is, which when you have these uh, powers that be that come in and do content regulation, what happens to the marginalized groups? Do they lose a voice or what's what's the end result? I said already that uh, I, I understand and I recognize the motivation from Facebook that they have seen as a problem and we want to do something. But the, the way how this is uh, uh, now managed uh, creates more questions than answers. So they have now managed a number of cases. I think the first six were published in January. Now they negotiate another 20. But the number of uh, cases which has arrived is uh, more than 200,000. That means the, the, the proposed mechanism with this uh, oversight board uh, probably won't work. And it won't work also for the reason that uh, whatever uh, they will argue that they are independent and Facebook will recognize, will not interfere. So uh, it is seen as an uh, created by Facebook. So that means, uh, and, and this will undermine uh, in the long run, also the, the independence of credibility. What you need is really a neutral third party. So, and uh, this has to be uh, established. So uh, the, the model, what I have in mind is, what's the long way to go from the model to the implementation is uh, the what we have in ICANN and it's called the uh, UDRP, the Uniform Dispute Resolution Policy with regard to domain names. So that means you create an, an, an independent panel, uh, you know, managed by uh, some so-called independent courts, cyber courts or whatever, digital courts, how you call it. So, and then you can handle this case by case. So I think with the UDRP, they have managed to uh, settle uh, nearly 100,000 conflicts for, the, for domain names. So I, I cannot see that a small group of people, very people, you know, I have a great respect, like the former Danish prime minister, the, 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 the lady, uh, uh, Madame Torning and others, so they have a good reputation, they have good wills, they are neutral as good as they can, but I personally have some uh, problems with the, um, uh, with the um, design of this oversight board and the whole idea, uh, because that does, does not really uh, 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 lead to uh, what I call the neutral third party. But to build a system with a neutral third party is a long way to go. Uh, I remember the conflict we had in building the UDRP. It was in Santiago de Chile in an ICANN meeting in 1999 when the trademark owners, you know, said, okay, we want to have the same rights in the domain name system. And there was a battle between the freedom fighters and the trademark owners and, you know, who managed this. But the UDRP produced Used a rather flexible and neutral system where if people are not satisfied with the outcome, they can, do, can, can go to a court. But the reality of the last 20 years has told us the story. 
more or less is accepted. And if you can manage uh, 100,000 cases and people are satisfied with that, this is a good step forward. And we should be more creative and innovative and uh, introducing systems, which would also allow, because the UDRP is cheap and it goes fast. So, uh, and, and, and I think this is what people also from marginalized groups, you know, uh, need. So, uh, they do not have the, the, the money to, to hire an expensive lawyer and they want to have a quick result. But it means whatever you plan to build, uh, is, it has to be cheap and fast. So, and uh, in so far, it has to be decentralized and distributed, but it has to follow common rules. So this is a challenge for the community for the next couple of years. On that note, uh, I think we can go on for uh, an incredibly uh, longer period, but I, I, I want uh, Alfredo to join us into the audio to uh, do final comments. Okay, Alfredo, over to you. Yeah, so, thank you. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm still on my cell phone. So uh, I do want to, to point out that Wolfgang just set up a stage and gave us a, a, a glimpse of what's to come. So we have nine more modules where we're going to start deep diving into each one, specifically into each one of the statements that uh, Wolfgang gave to us. So keep your questions. Uh, on the table and, and and look into each one of the contents of the modules use the discussion forums to talk about underserved communities the future of broadband uh what's happening with fragmentation of the internet the geopolitical issues uh the legal issues we cover all that within each one of the modules yeah. and we have some open questions for each one of you i do want to thank Wolfgang again, he gave gave a great overview of what to expect towards the future of the internet and internet governance. So thank you. Back to you, Glenn. Great, thank you, folks. Uh, Wolfgang, we're, I guess I'll join you in a little, a few minutes uh, on another meeting. But uh, again, uh, great, great discussion in the chat. And and Wolfgang, please stay stay into the course. Do you, you know, you're you're welcome to stimulate discussion and. Please promote your um, your uh, your school. So uh, m many of the students in this program might be interested in applying. And I think it's in May, right, when the um, application uh, process starts. Uh, the no, no, the application has already closed, so it's in August. Uh, but uh, we will hope to have in 2022. Uh, and as a real meeting, so uh, the announcement will be in January 2022. So if you want to apply, uh, have a look on the uh, website and, and then you can apply. And yeah. uh, thank you for having me and uh, um, Glenn, let's stay in contact. And I wish all your fellows best for uh, the next 10 years. It will become difficult years, but it will be exciting, exhausting and exciting. Great right. to you. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. We'll see you all online and next week for uh, uh, Fred Baker's discussion on actors. Thanks again. Bye everyone. Bye bye.